Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation to give a talk at the brown bag seminar. I saw one person with a brown bag, but there aren't too many. Uh, <laughs> there are two now, uh, I see. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, so I'll, I'll be talking a bit about digital asset management and the subtitle is, is the slogan we use in Munich to entice students to uh, attend financial econometrics classes. When they ask what is financial econometrics, the answer is it's money and models and immediately next semester the participation rate goes up, in particular the male students think uh, this must be attractive. Uh, maybe some disappointment. This is, I'm, I'm here in, in a room where um, I assume everybody knows more about uh, digital economics or the digenomics than I do. Uh, my usual talks, uh, they, they, they look more like this. This is sort of uh, what I'm talk, used to talk about. Uh, but don't pay too much attention uh, to that slide. Um, <coughs> I'm. Um, I'm, I'm, but also occasionally I give talks to sort of uh, a, a non-academic audience and then I have you know, the most overstrained uh, quote uh, we, we know about uh, is from Bill Gates, one of the, in the US, considered to be one of the uh, major philosophers they have these days. Um, that's he, <coughs> that's uh, his quote, but does anybody know when he said it? How old is the quote? Sorry? It's from the 1990s. It's 94, so it's exactly a quarter century ago he made it. And uh, <coughs> we feel there hasn't been too much of a change. So we still have banks around, even so he, he, he thought we, we don't need them. Um, but uh, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, things progress typically not as fast as one anticipates. Another quote of his, his is, uh, um, we, are <coughs> we, we are sort of overestimating what can be accomplished in, in one year, but we are underestimating what can be accomplished in 10 years. And so we'll see maybe uh, 10, maybe it's 25 years. <coughs> so what I want to talk about is, is um, a, a bit about banking. Uh, uh, so where, where I see where things are and, and why they are the way they are. Uh, about fintech, uh, uh, then more digital asset management in, in particular, and I'll, then there will be the commercial block on scalable capital, and uh, describe a little bit what, what's being done there, and then my view how things could develop in, in, in the market. So I'm not sure how it is, but if there are any questions or so, just ask and interrupt, and <coughs> if it's too, uh, too many, I'll, I'll, I'll stop it. Um, so what's the status quo? Uh, what, what, what are banks doing typically? Uh, and, and this is sort of what I consider to be full service banks. Uh, they, they are bundling services, everything that has to do with money. And it used to be the one-stop shop uh, where you went in order to uh, uh, deal with money issues, you know, whether it's payment, deposits, credits, and many things they were doing. Uh, so this was the, the, the one place to go to. Um, and there's all, it's also the, the central intermediary between all sorts of agents uh, in, or, or, or of, of uh, institutions and, and human beings in all sorts of roles. You know, with employer, employee, buyer, seller, saver, borrower. It's always a bank in between many of the activities you know, uh, uh, we are dealing with. And um, uh, um, <clears throat> when, when you now talk to bankers, and occasionally I am at some practitioners uh, 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 or, or semi-academic uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, conference or, or workshop and then you hear the, the, the bankers are typically complaining about what, what sort of, what's the hard thing, what, what are the problems they're facing. It's regulation, it's low interest rates, it's uh, digitization. Um, and but that's, I think, only part of the story. There are other problems. You know, it's what I call cross-subsidiaritis, so this cross-subsidization between the services they are offering um, is sort of an unhealthy situation. There's a huge reputational problems they have. In, in the old days, you know, students, at least from, from 
statistics or so they you know, working for going to a bank or insurance company in, in Munich you know, that that was often the first priority you know, they, you know, if you had a uh, we offer uh, bachelor master degrees in statistics uh, and so the many had first priority go to uh, the banking industry or so that has changed uh, you know f has, has to do with Lehman and crisis and uh, uh, generally, the, the reputation of the sector, and of course, we have other interesting players now. Uh, big data uh, issues are that's more the Googles and Amazons, where you can uh, uh, sort of uh, make a good living with statistical knowledge. The other problem is um, legacy, legacy IT, and the way communication is run in the sector. Now I'll say about uh, probably one slide for each of the uh, points, except digitization. Uh, uh, there will be a few more later. Um, regulation. So there is a little bit German uh, occasionally in there, but this is sort of, you know, the, you hear the, the comments, well, we can't do anything anymore. We can't talk to the clients the way we want to. Uh, and if we do so, you know, the, we, we have to start with three pages of disclaimers first, and then we can talk about substance, and afterwards we have to take the minutes of the talk and uh, and have it signed and so on. So it's just they feel like they're so constrained in what they can do that they really can't do their uh, original business as they used to. The other one is low interest rates. You know, it's sort of typically a lot of it was simply uh, based on, on, a, on a multiple of, of, of uh, the prime rate uh, in uh, the central bank's charge and, and we see you know the red is US, uh, blue is ECB. Um, we, we see that um, it used to be a little bit in sync, sort of, until Lehman uh, uh, crisis, uh, and uh, with Europe always following six months, 12, 18 months behind. But that's not anymore the case. You know, sort of, it got out of sync, and uh, we, it, and and so this is sort of uh, one of the major complaints we also hear. But <coughs> cross subsidy subsidization. Uh, so what, what do banks do? Things are, are changing a bit now, but typically what we saw, they're, 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 they, use, they offer services to the big masses uh, f uh, for nothing. You know, it used to be your current account, you didn't have to pay anything for this um, in order to uh, attract a, a, a large customership. Um, and, and then you had services that, that did cost, probably they were sort of uh, break even uh, uh, the, the, the revenues and the cost that came up. And then you had sort of high, uh, payment services like wealth management and things like this or money transfer you know sending uh, 200 euro to Turkey or so that's where banks uh, uh, earn their money and often used by a few but they are subsidizing uh, the large masses. Uh, <coughs> reputation there is a Edelman trust barometer where they um, uh, every year ask uh, about reputation of various um, um, sectors of the economy and uh, not so easy to see but very far on the bottom you know finance is, is, is dead last year in this race and has come up a little bit but it's still way uh, below the automobile industry despite diesel gate and, and, and things like that and if you look at uh, this is sort of worldwide and if you look at different regions in Germany it's the worst uh, the reputation they have even a worse reputation uh, than, than the diesels uh, in, in Germany and also compared to all the other uh, major financial hubs in, in at least. Uh, even so, if you ask individuals, then they say, well, you know, bankers are all crooks except my banker. Uh, my banker is an exception. Uh, so somehow there is a disparity there. Um, legacy IT. Uh, uh, when we think of banks, banks, insurance companies, pioneers of digitization. Uh, but that was sometime in the last century. You know, the, the, the big push came in the 60s and the 1970s, and then it, it slowed down. And if you go uh, to a huge bank these days in the basement, you, you see these pictures here. Uh, and uh, my question to you is, is that an archive picture from the archive, or is it sort of a current picture? You know? Hardware-wise, you couldn't tell. The clothes, <laughs> the clothes are still the same, the hairstyle is, is Pretty much uh, fitting here also. So what's your guess? Wild guess. The, uh, in, if I talk to a practitioner's finance audience, 
and, the, and there is a chief risk officer in there, he knows immediately. It's from the archive, because you know? these chairs are not allowed anymore. <laughs> you have to have five legs in the, in the EU. You know? that's, that's a must. <laughs> so it, I don't know where it's from. Uh, um, and, and I think the hardware has slightly changed a bit. You know? but, uh, but Professor Hornoff, has, I've seen one article where you wrote about COBOL programs and uh, sort of that, that's still major uh, uh, software that's being used in these companies. And I have a friend, his, his uncle is in the mid-70s, he's you know, age-wise, and he uh, still has to go to the basements and fix uh, or keep these, these uh, systems running. Um, and COBOL was the first language I learned when I was a student. And, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to go to the basements yet. Communication. Um, it, it, I don't, the, the most mail, physical mail I get, paper mail uh, in, at home is from banks. You know, I, even so, I have you know, digital mailboxes there, this and that. You still keep getting letters, uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, probably 10 a week or something it feels like. And you know, that's the way it works. It's still sort of a one-way thing. You know, you go to a branch, you talk to somebody, they relay the information to the headquarter, they process things, and then they write a letter, send it through the post, and get it to you. Uh, that's the way it works. Uh, nowadays, uh, even so, I'm uh, not quite that generation, but you know, communication these days looks probably more like like that here. Um, so, what are fintechs doing there? Uh, so what is fintech? This is my only equation I have here. You know, it's financial services plus technology equals fintech. So it's, uh, um, I could even give that talk in the US MBA course. Uh, um, um, so and what, 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 do, what are we talking about? So there's this business intelligence uh, um, company, they survey every year sort of what's out there. And just look at the headlines. So we have here uh, a robo-advisor or digital asset management, personal finance. We have uh, a reg text de 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 dealing with regulatory issues. Uh, and it's sort of amazing that you need that many uh, or, or that you need, in fact, companies that only deal with regulatory issues. But that's the way it works. Then we have the, um, so here, these are the big players. Uh, World Scalable somehow made it also in there. But there are some huge uh, the Cloud Betterment is the huge um, uh, U.S. company uh, and Wealthfront next to it. These are sort of the, 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 the um, original um, uh, uh, companies that had the idea to automate uh, investment processes and make it available to the average uh, uh, um, investor. Uh, then we have the, the digital banks here, the N26 and all the others that are out there, Germany and Fedor Bank in Munich. Uh, which you can buy right now. They're on the table. If you uh, uh, get together, pool together, you may think of it. And then we have the payment issue, a big uh, um, um, uh, um, area. And PayPal is, of course, well known there. Then the whole blockchain, uh, Bitcoin uh, uh, industry. Insurance has come uh, with some delay. Um, and there's alternative finance. And then we have also sort of, this is like RegTech, you know, a digital um, identity uh, verification. So banks need to know whether, if I apply for an account, whether I'm really Stefan Mitnick and not somebody else. So they have to be identified properly. Know your customer, KYC is sort of the thing. So this is what, what's sort of roughly out there. Uh, and what, what is sort of the tech part? You know? uh, there's a second equation I see. Um, tech, you know, it's essentially digitization and automation and everything in between. You know? and, and in between, you may have things like big data. You may have things like artificial intelligence. Even so, you know, it's not clear. People know, whether, well, there's not a clear-cut definition of it. And it's not uh, clear you know, if, if you open up a book on artificial intelligence and usage in, in, in sort of big data context, then the first thing you learn is regression analysis. You know? So uh, I don't know where, where sort of traditional uh, um, methods and AI methods start. But the, the, the next point is the crucial one. It's the algorithmization. So 
it, it's sort of a rule-based processes you have. And those you can put in an algorithm, and the algorithm can be automated. You now it can be implement, uh, programmed, implemented, automated. That's the crucial part. And that's the difference in digital asset management versus classical asset management, uh, where decisions in classical, you know, there are probably also some rules are out there. Uh, it's not clear how explicitly they are followed or whether the asset manager you know, reads the newspaper in the morning and decides today BMW is better than Daimler or the other way around, things like this. Uh, um, so, but the tech uh, part in FinTech also they have their challenges. You know, one is the, the aim is high scalability. You, know, you want to offer the services for, for the masses. So what, what does it mean? You have a high initial investment. You need really a huge amount of money and resources and, and manpower in order to get this going. And, um, uh, the, and the benefit is the marginal costs are virtually zero at the end. So each additional customer doesn't cost you anything. You know? At scalable, each additional customer means we have to rent a few more, uh, a bit more capacity somewhere in the cloud for, for computing. That's the only cost. Um, and um, this makes it so hard for, say, conventional um, uh, uh, say banks you know, to, to introduce similar services. You, know, you, you, if you, you have this great idea uh, in, this, in, in your bank and say, I want to, you know, we should offer a service like this as well. And uh, you go to the, to the board or whoever is on the board responsible for you. We, we have a gatekeeper here. Not everybody can come in. Next time you'll be knocked over and the next person comes in. <laughs> so you, you walk up to the board and say, hey, guys, I need 20 million euro and I need 20 people for 12 months. Uh, and then I can sort of uh, pull this off. Uh, and and uh, th this is even for a large bank, this, this is these are serious resources. And then you have the you know, employee representatives, Betriebsrat, and they ask, what, what is this for, uh, 20 million? And they say, well, for automation. And you know, it may not be, uh, they may not be overly enthusiastic about that idea. Uh, um, the other thing is it, it only, you can only convince uh, 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 users to, to use your service if it has a high usability. You know, it has to be better than what's out there. So which means the user experience or customer journey uh, needs to be uh, at least as good in, as in a non-automated way. And major feature is you know any time and any anywhere. Um, you know I I don't know uh, when were you last time in a bank branch without uh, just going to the money machine. That's the typical answer I get when I ask my students. It's sort of they have to think, uh, and it's the new students who move to Munich. Maybe they open the account at the Münchner Sparkasse or something like that. But they haven't been there except the money machine. You know, that that they know. So you know, the, you know, many don't want to you know, just getting an appointment, arranging. Well, uh, meet me in the business hour somewhere between you know, uh, fr uh, Friday three o'clock is not banking business hour, but you know Thursday at two o'clock or so. That you have to meet somebody physically at a, at a given time at a given place. Um, you, you know people are not used to that. At least sort of people somewhat younger than I am, you know, there's asynchronous communication. You know, if you WhatsApp with somebody, you can do that at any time, anywhere. You don't have to be somewhere and you don't, you don't have to be at the same time sort of uh, on, on some device or so. Um, what about the strategies that, that fintechs are pursuing? You know, and it, it's sort of three things I'm putting that into. It's disintermediation, it's unbundling, and it's rebundling. Um, and disintermediation means you know, essentially cutting out the middleman in, in activities. And the, the classical um, example is peer-to-peer -peer lending. You know, rather than I as a saver give my, uh, uh, save my 2,000 euro at, at, at uh, my um, uh, current account or uh, some other uh, fixed um, uh, uh, duration savings account or something like this, um, uh, and uh, somebody else goes to the bank and says, I need 5,000 euro to buy uh, a, a, a new uh, furniture for the living room or something. You interact directly. 
you know, from you, 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 you lend money directly to the person without a bank in between, but on the other hand, there's, not, there's an internet platform or something in between also, so it's not uh, that, that you don't act uh, directly, uh, you never know the person you, you give money to, but you learn certain uh, characteristics and, and one is of course sort of uh, a score indicating what's the likelihood of getting my money uh, back at, at the end. But this is sort of one, one example. Yeah? So it's an unbundling uh, that is taking place. And, um, and what do the fintechs do? Of course, they pick those services that are overpriced. And that simply are um, uh, uh, the sort of the, the cash cows of the bank. And uh, they are, so what happens is the fintechs have typically then um, work in an area where they have relatively, or there's potential for relatively high profit margins, uh, and the banks are losing those. You know? So that's for, it's sort of the worst thing banks um, yeah, um, would like to uh, sacrifice. And uh, they, they're not only shrinking sort of in, in terms of the um, range of services they are providing, but, or, or the, you know, the demand is shrinking for the range of services they are providing, but it's also the high pricing services. Yeah. Um, so what, 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 are the, what, what can you do as a, if you are sort of in work for an established bank? What, what are the strategies? So this is the picture we usually have in mind. So there's the big bank, the big fish, and there are these per, piranhas chasing um, uh, the big bank. So what I call them the four C options. What are, what are they doing? So they can copy these things, and uh, they can co cooperate. They can acquire. There is a C in there somewhere and they can capitulate. These are essentially the options they have. And we see all four of them. Uh, this is, everything happens. So uh, copying the uh, uh, if, uh, uh, banks uh, have started their own uh, digital asset manager, robo-advisor, um, and um, some with success, some stop doing it. Corporations are very common. Uh, and uh, uh, simply taking over. Or in, in the asset management business, uh, if you look at the, the, the typical small asset manager, uh, I don't know, having managing like 100 million euro or so, or 200, 300, um, they say, well, I'll be retiring in five years or, or whenever, and uh, I won't do anything in that direction. My customers are as old as I am or even older, uh, and, and uh, whether, uh, their, their kids or so when they inherit uh, the, the, the wealth, whether they come to me as a customer, I don't know. So they just say, you know, as long as the business lasts for another five years, I'm fine. Uh, uh, then I'll just uh, quit. Uh, um, so now digital asset management, I want to dive in. What, so we were aiming for 45 or something like? Uh, yeah, I think we are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh, a digital asset manager, we have different types. Uh, if you look at one, is, you know, it, it's not clear what it is, you know, a robot by the digital asset manager. As I say, you, know, um, you could uh, sometimes, if you look through the, the web, what you find there and you think you know, every asset manager, asset, asset managing company that has a website calls him, him or herself now a robo advisor. Um, it all sometimes feels like that. But uh, generally what we have is we have information providing platforms. It's sort of what we know uh, before. And it's essentially gather, gathering sort of in a hopefully smart way information that uh, um, uh, leads the, the investors to exactly you know, the information they are looking for and the products that, that they are fitting for their strategy or for whatever they're um, um, aiming for. And then there are sort of tools directly, so you can sort of essentially, you know, you have tens of thousands of products potentially out there, and you can set certain filters, um, and then you get a, a subset of what's out there, the asset universe out there, and you can um, sort of more, uh, uh, you know, the, the essentially focuses the, the search somewhat. Then there's something called investment intermediary or so, which you know, it's called in Germany, it's Vermittler, Finanzvermittler, where <coughs> essentially they're helping you uh, also finding the right product, but typically it's the product of some uh, investment fund company or so where the um, 
the intermediary has a contract with and, and gets a certain uh, commission or bonus from selling a particular funder. So, but they're not asset manager in a sense because they're not allowed to, to manage your assets. So what we understand or what's understood under asset manager, it's, uh, first they are regulated by the regulator in Germany, the BaFin and Bundesbank. Um, and, um, and, they, they, and as an investor, I give the asset manager the mandate to, to manage my assets. So I just say here are 10,000 euro and uh, we agree on some uh, management investment strategy and you do the rest for me. You know, I don't want to be bothered. So that's uh, the, the difference. In, in traditional asset management, well, this is just what I said. You know, it, it's uh, the investor mandates the asset manager to act on his or her behalf. And um, <clears throat> typically you need a million euro in Germany to get the service like that. Now, sometimes you may get with a half a million, others uh, may, maybe three million or so, but you need a huge amount of money in order to get this sort of classical uh, asset management services. Um, and if you are below that, then essentially you get something, you know, what it's just that, that's sort of the plain banking advisory uh, business you get. It's essentially you walk there and they sell you the the fund of the day or so, uh, or of the week, and you got, you know, as very often you get a fund that's sort of an in-house product uh, produced by the bank uh, or the, 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 the group the bank is affiliated with, or they sell you some product where they uh, receive a high commission for selling it to you, and they not only get one time uh, a commission, but you know, annually they get you know, half a percent or whatever of the sum you invested in that particular product. And so it's not, it, the, the, it's not really advice, it's a sales talk essentially you're getting and um, um, you know, it's not clear whether you get the right products for you and the costs are typically quite high. You know, if you add everything together, um, uh, you may end up 3% or so of uh, the, the amount invested that that's, um, you, you have to pay annually. And you know, that means the, in, <coughs> the investment has to essentially make 3% per year before you see anything uh, from it. <coughs> um, and uh, then the, the other thing is if there are many studies where showing that sort of Tradi traditional asset management hardly beat you know, their benchmarks. So they compare, you know, every year you have like 25% that are better than whatever the benchmark may be. Some, some index, uh, stock index, or some mixture of a stock and bond index. 25% uh, are beating the index, but every year it's other, you know, it's not the same 25% every year. They're you know, changing from year to year. So, and you would have to predict which one of the 25% uh, does this particular asset manager belong to. Um, and it's mainly um, the high cost that makes it in the long term difficult. You know, when I say 25% may be better than the benchmark, that's in one year. If you look over five year performance, 10 year performance or more, the percentage beating a benchmark gets smaller and smaller. Um, and um, it has mainly to do with the cost, but also sometimes the, the, the investment decision processes are uh, not so clear. You know. um, in, in digital asset management, uh, so what, what sort of special or what's different there? One is the onboarding process. Is, is everything's completely uh, uh, online. So you, <coughs> you don't have to go anywhere um, uh, and you, you don't even have to sign anything, you know, which is in Germany uh, a bit of a surprise that you can uh, uh, essentially establish a contract uh, where between uh, um, 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 investor, a uh, private investor and, and um, a, a financial institution uh, without any wet signature. You, know, you just have to uh, go through certain standards procedures and, uh, and you do that and it may take you 15 minutes or so and then you have already your bank account with the um, asset manager or with the, with the bank behind the asset manager uh, without uh, having ever left your living room or so. And, and we see that at Scalable, you know, most customers come over the weekend where there is nobody in, in, in the Scalable office either um, because that's when people have time. And it's sort of an automated, in our case, a quantitative uh, based uh, investment process that typically it's a rule based at least in, 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 uh, in all cases. Uh, the costs are lower, in part substantially lower 
half or a third of the cost in traditional asset management. And uh, the fees are typically very transparent. Uh, now we have this MIFID II regulation where the fees need to be um, <coughs> um, opened up. They need to be communicated um, to uh, investors. But uh, we still not, if you look at some of the information you get, it's sort of uh, uh, still somewhat hard to figure out. You know? I was at the bank uh, because my personal uh, uh, um, um, advisor, they said they changed and so they, I got back in there and they want to sell me some certain product and I you know, immediately asked about the cost and so on and it was a bit too high anyway. But then I went home and read all the fine print. You know, and there was even uh, only half of the cost uh, that was communicated to me verbally, and the other half I had to dig out in the 16 pages of fine print. You know? um, and that added another, I don't know, 0.67% or something. Um, and it's, uh, it's cost-efficient investment products that uh, are typically used. So exchange-traded funds, index funds, um, that are passively managed products uh, where there is no active asset manager who does what they call research, uh, and um, uh, you know, which, which usually eats up a lot of uh, resources there. And of course, the convenience factor, as I mentioned, uh, usability is, is an issue. Uh, so scalable, uh, just to give you some uh, uh, insights sort of what's happening there. So this is a company uh, uh, was founded in uh, end of 2014. Uh, and mainly ex-Goldman Sachs uh, 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 people switched sides, essentially. And one of them was a former student from Kiel who Martin Missong and I sort of uh, still know from the days uh, in Kiel. Uh, we were live uh, in, in 2016, January, uh, we went live, which was a bad timing because January, February 2016, the German stock, and not only the German, but stock markets really took a large hit. You know, the DAX lost about, what, 18 or so percent, um, and uh, uh, what, which was the worst start for the DAX uh, since uh, it was, uh, uh, came to life. Um, and of course, you know, it's, and, and, and people think about, should I you know, send money to a small startup company I've never heard of before, I can't even pronounce. Uh, should I send them 10, 20,000 euro? Um, so it was, it was not, not, not the easiest start. You know? by, but uh, by now it's sort of uh, 100 employees active in, in the German speaking area and also in the UK, regulated uh, by German and the British uh, uh, regulator. Al so it's an algorithm based portfolio management. Now we are uh, at least in Germany or in continental Europe, the largest digital asset manager with over um, uh, a billion, which is milliarde, uh, just to make sure uh, <laughs> you're not getting confused. <laughs> uh, um, and, and think, why is he standing here? Uh, and, um, and, and so, as I said, you need tons of money to, to get this off the ground. And uh, so the, 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 the initial money came from the founders and management, but then we added a venture capitalist, Holspring Venture, Tengelmann and, and BlackRock f f f uh, also then joined um, uh, more than a year ago and uh, a year and a half ago. And which is, they are they're the largest, uh, uh, world's largest asset manager altogether. But, and also, um, and this is sort of some, we occasionally get criticized, they're also the company that has the largest market share in these ETF products that they are issuing. Uh, but we are not, you know, probably half, at least, at most half of the products we use uh, are black rock products in our universe, and which is a lower portion than the average German private investor has. They have probably two thirds of, of their, if they have these ETF products and they have two thirds black rock products, I read some statistics somewhere. So, um, um, so it, it, what it, what, how does it work? And this is, it's not scale, this is sort of digital asset management, general works like that. You, you, there's an online questionnaire and, and uh, the regulation tells you what, what needs to be asked, certain questions. It's not clear how you ask uh, these things, but you have to, uh, uh, you have to go through a risk classification as an investor. You, you have to find out what is sort of the right product or 
the right um, um, amount of risk uh, an investor can bear. And it's sort of one is the, the, the appetite for risk, sort of the personal attitude towards risk, but the other thing is the, the, the risk bearing capability. You know, you may be a risk loving person, but if you have only you know, 500 euro uh, of uh, um, all your savings, then uh, uh, you won't be able to become a customer at any of even the digital um, as management. And the financial status so is, is crucial. Then, uh, so typically what you get a proposal, sort of proposed, this is the right risk level and that's scalable, you get 23 risk classes and they're all classified by some, uh, uh, in, 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 at least in, uh, in, among financial institutions, known, well-known risk measure at the so-called value at risk. Um, and uh, so you get a recommendation, you can choose that or you can choose something that is lower, but it cannot be higher than uh, what the, 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 uh, the evaluation of the, the questionnaire essentially uh, produced. And then you get an investment strategy that comes with it and, and, uh, and the, ultimately the client has to choose you know, which of the risk levels I pick and with that uh, it's also the investment strategy. And then you get a portfolio that's set up uh, sort of globally diversified in ETFs among, uh, across different types of assets in different regions. And then this sort of, there's an ongoing risk monitoring and, uh, and, and if the risk situation in the markets change, then the portfolio is adjusted accordingly. And so this is sort of an old graphic of what the process is, but you have two sides. You have, have the client here and you have the, the financial markets uh, the asset universe and scalable again is sort of an intermediary between the two and now I won't go through but you know, I could now you know, discuss ev every box uh, what, what is being done there and so on and, uh, uh, and where, there is, where there are models and what kind of models um, one can do but I'll, I'll save this sort of but essentially you have a, sort of a risk profile and you have asset profiles and you're matching something uh, in optimizer to produce an what's called optimal portfolio, even so we know uh, um, ex, uh, ex post they're usually not optimal, um, but uh, and, and ultimately then the customer uh, gets sort of um, you know, sort of in, 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 in real time information and uh, can uh, monitor also what's happening. And just why risk space? I just put up one graph here. Um, we see two lines here. The red one, uh, the, 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 the greenish one is uh, the DAX as it performed, what, uh, November 2005. This is run stops at mid 16, 2016, but it doesn't change in general. And the DAX, and then this is the risk of the DAX, uh, the DAX volatility, VDAX. And you see there is sort of a bit of an inverse relationship there. Uh, uh, typically, and then there, this is sort of like the, the midline here, the risk uh, um, uh, midline, and uh, what one sees is um, typically if the risk sort of jumps above uh, this, this uh, dashed line, that's usually bad news for, for the DAX, and uh, one tries sort of somewhat to balance this. And I have, I have a small section here of, uh, I cut out, this is around the, um, Lehman uh, crisis, so in, um, uh, so in, in, in mid-September 2008, Lehman announced uh, that they filed for bankruptcy, uh, which sort of was you know, the, the first time you know, sort of worldwide, uh, the, the uh, broad audience realized there is a problem in the financial markets, and I was in that week in uh, New York teaching and uh, so, I mean, Manhattan lives, you know, is, is sort of half Manhattan is, is Wall Street. Uh, it was, was a crazy time uh, there. Um, but that was only sort of, you know, sort of essentially the sort of the final signal. Uh, 14 months earlier, Bear Stearns um, announced the two of their hedge funds that were investing in asset, you know, in mortgage backed securities, sort of in, in real estate um, financing announced two of the hedge funds essentially lost 80, 90 percent of their value. And um, um, this is sort of when you see the, the S&P sort of was rising you know, steadily more or less before that. It was still recovering from the dot-com crisis 2000, 2003. Um, and, and, and things changed. You know, all of a sudden sort of it goes sideways and goes downward. And, uh, 
I, uh, just to add that also, I used to be in that week in New York when that happened, and uh, now I can't enter the country anymore. So, uh, or at least friends ask me, when are you going next time? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and here I have simply the, the returns or, or essentially the, 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 you see the, the, the fluctuation of the, the index level and you see in the, in the recovery period from dot com extremely small uh, uh, variations. You, know, you, you see sort of 1%, 2% most uh, are the daily uh, uh, index movements and they immediately double, tripled after the Bear Stern thing. You know, that sort of, you, you see that. And of course then Lehman uh, then then even the dentists realized there's something wrong with the financial markets. And that's, then you know when dentists buy or sell, you know, you should be contrarian probably. And here I simply have sort of the, the, the risk level. You know, so you know, the red line is essentially the, the value at risk proxy for the, the, the S&P 500. And if you are an investor, uh, who is classified at value at risk 20, which means in our case you invest, uh, uh, you, you, you're sort of accepting that you may lose 20% um, uh, or more uh, over one year uh, period uh, with a probability of 5%. So every 20 years you are accepting to lose uh, more than 5%. And this is sort of the value at risk. And if you're a VAR 20 guy, then the, the S&P 500 risk was uh, well below most of the time in the pre um, uh, uh, Bear Stearns period, except one, two exceptions. And then you were above. And what the algorithm does, you know, Ceteris Paribus, it's a bit more complicated because you have you know, uh, 10, 15 assets in your portfolio. But everything else equal, you would sort of overweigh S&P as long as the red line is below the black, you would underweight uh, S&P as long as the um, red line is above um, the, the black line. Uh, and so that's sort of the motivation behind. So where, where's, what, you know, where could things go from here? Uh, so I used all my Latin I know, I started with you know, banking status quo, and now we are at quo vadis. Uh, and uh, let's see. So what I think is this, this unbundling will still continue. You know? Full service banks are like uh, you know, the cash stats from yesterday. You know, it's, it's very hard uh, to, to you know, offer a full service at a high quality um, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and earn a living with that. So you'll see this unbundling going on. They're all possible. Um, um, areas where this could happen. Huh? But uh, there will be, uh, 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 those fintechs will be specializing in certain, much more specialized in, in certain uh, service they offer and there will be also some rebundling taking place. You know? So, um, and, and some of them will really make it and become a standalone service provider. They'll be big enough uh, and, and uh, uh, we, we will see that, um, you know, Company and we've seen that all, we see that all the time. Also in the in the digital asset management, we see uh, the early the, the, the first two German uh, uh, companies that went into the market. They are not there anymore, and um, and others are being bought or so. So it, 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 there won't be that many left. It's like the automobile industry in the early you know, uh, 20th century. You had hundreds and hundreds of car manufacturers in the U.S. And, uh, and we know how many are left. Uh, so this is sort of one direction things could go, but others could be uh, not become sort of a standalone provider, but they sort of do some rebundling, will be part of a bundle or part of a platform. And so we'll see a, a small number of platforms, you know, there's the term platform as a service, um, where we see they may end up with, you know, but the question is, you know, uh, who, you know, what platforms or who, whose platforms are these? Would bank be in a position to offer these plat platforms or um, it, would that be non-bank platforms? You know? and, and we know we have highly potent platforms out there. You know? uh, these are names he, uh, even I've heard of uh, and there are a few others out there and, and especially the Chinese platforms uh, are, are extremely uh, uh, potent there. Uh, and so one could end up, on, uh, things could end up on these platforms. Uh, and the question is who will be surviving in which form? You know? And um, 
and it depends somewhat on the type of business. So one, if you enter a business where you know, the, there's a small profit margin only, uh, then you need a large market share. And that's sort of a, a tough uh, business to get into. You know, it's sort of this saying is the winner needs it all, essentially. Not all, but you need a huge uh, share of the whole market in order to make it. You know. and, and, and who will that be? You know, sort of the, the fast and the financed. Uh, you, know, the, you have to be fast and you have to uh, uh, be well financed in order to succeed in these um, uh, uh, types of business models. The other thing is when it, uh, um, it, it's a business model that works with network effects. You know? um, and that this is sort of typically then it, it, that produces naturally only one or maybe a few dominant players. You know? And that's sort of the winner takes it all kind of uh, story. And what are network effects? Uh, uh, it's, it's network effects is essentially uh, e economies of usage. You know? It's sort of um, uh, if, if, uh, if um, and the example I have is the telephone. Uh, if I'm the only person in the world who has a telephone, it's not overly useful. You, know? you can polish it every day and things like that, but there's nothing you can do with it. You know? But if Martin Misson also has a telephone, you know, he can talk to me, I can talk to him. So there is sort of, you know? and <coughs> if three, four uh, people also have one, you know, the, the number of connections uh, is essentially the usefulness. You know? And uh, it's, it, it grows essentially quadratically, in this case, the, 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 the usefulness. You know? Or if you're on a dating platform. You know? If I'm the only customer in a dating platform, uh, it'll be pretty boring, you know? But uh, uh, so it's, it's sort of, so you have the, the you know, the, 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 the tendency that um, the masses are, uh, you know, the people go to the platforms that are the largest and you get immediately um, sort of, uh, these effects, I have the LMU twice in there, very good. Um, and um, uh, so that's sort of the winner takes, and we see that the Facebooks and the Googles and the like, these are, these are the kind of businesses uh, that benefit from network effects. Um, and then you have, but then there's all the other, you, you, know, they don't, you don't need a huge market because maybe the, 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 the margins, the, the profit margins are, are uh, quite large and you don't work on network effects and asset management is like that. You know, asset management, um, the, the profit margin is high and I as a customer has no, have no benefit uh, from the fact that Martin Missing was also a customer there. Uh, it, it, uh, obviously, I don't want that the asset manager goes bankrupt and needs certain amount of customers, but whether it has a thousand or five thousand I have no benefit from that. So that's a different thing. So it's to say the winners split it all. There will be winners and they somehow, and you can, even the world's largest uh, um, um, uh, private wealth manager, uh, I think is UBS and they have a market share worldwide of less than 3% or so, or the, the largest German asset manager have a, a market share of less than a percent or so. So you need only tiny margin in order to make it. The question is, uh, you could think of independent sort of standalone platforms. It's your mobile phone that's the platform. You know, it's always you know, one thumb left or a right. You, you use a different services. So this, this could also, you know, you could end up uh, simply as, as a part of, of sort of, I call this an independent platform. Even so, you have Android or, or iOS behind it. Uh, but um, you're not part of a, of a, a conglomerate uh, of, of uh, a large corporation or so. Uh, but <laughs> typically, it, it, things may also end up uh, that, that you have, you end up, you know, the situation may look like this. You know, we think of all these agile fintechs, but in reality, they might may be, may be gone uh, sometime soon. This is where I stop, and I think pretty much sort of on time. Thank you for your patience. And then I have some, I have some autocorrelation functions if somebody's <laughs> interested. <laughs> So the, the, the bad thing about um, digital asset management, everything is digital. If, it were, if I was a traditional guy, I would have had now forms for you to sign to how to become a customer of scalable capital, but I can't. Uh, yeah. So why would you say uh, FinTech conversion in the first place? Uh, because you would think about 
not all the direct banks, uh, for instance, they have been there before, they were completely online. Uh, most of the banks we have, I mean, they're digitized, right? I mean, they, I mean, you didn't trade securities by physically moving the security from A to B. Uh, well, you'll be surprised. <laughs> you may be surprised how many companies where you still need to send a fax in order to order <laughs> stocks or so they're still out there, but not the yeah. major banks, not, that's true. And, and also for direct banks, I, I would say they are around also since the 90s, so <coughs> they've been there. And so the question I would have, is it really a problem of digitization? Uh, and are the banks already digitized? Uh, or is it more a problem of providing some value to the customer in a sense that, I mean, the reason why people are not going to their bank uh, Probably it's not that he's not available at uh, nine at night or ten at night. But I mean, the question is, why are you there in the first place? Uh, so he must offer you something. And the question is, what? Well, it's um, you would think, uh, say, in 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 a lot of these developments. If you think a lot of the startup ideas we we see in in, in Europe or Germany. Uh, you know, are originally from other places. A lot of them comes from the U.S. or so, and uh, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I think the, the the situation in the U.S. is somewhat uh, different from us. The, the digitization is not as far as we think. You know, there, if you, there, there are still places where you physically pick up your paycheck every month or every two weeks and things like this. So. Um, uh, it, it's not uh, as convenient as we have it here. Um, and there, uh, there also was probably uh, not much of a need. I mean, the, 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 the direct banks um, had, a, had a, you know, a, a business model that worked rather well until you know, uh, uh, some, some small companies came up in Germany, Flatex and, and some of the others. But typically, uh, but they're also not independent. They're all, you know, Consors belongs to BNP in, in, in Paris, and, and, and what, do, what do we have else? Uh, the AB or something. Uh, no, they even merged now. So they, they're part of, of typically of a large bank or Comdirect or something. So they're also uh, um, um, somewhat um, inflexible there. And <coughs> the, the, the major, one major thing is sort of cannibalization. Now, if I have a high price service, I, I, I you know, earn 3% or 2%, why should I open up something that gives me only 1% uh, or half percent or something in profit? So you, you try to stay away from that. And even now you see quite a few players have, uh, say, this robo-advice uh, um, services they offer, but they're not pushing it. Now, if you ask for it, uh, you really have to know what you're asking for, and then they may, uh, you know, my bank where I'm a customer, they, they in fact, they had some kind of uh, cardboard figure standing there at, uh, and pointing to the, their robo-advice service, and when I asked the lady behind the counter, I said, oh, you're, you're really advertising your robo-advisor, and, and she didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, uh, even so, she was seeing that, for, well, from behind, however, so I don't know, she never saw the front or so, I don't know. Um, so they are not pushing this, uh, because it, 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 you know, they're, they're you know, like other banks, like um, that, that have, don't suffer from cannibalization, like ING, they don't, at least in Germany, they don't do, um, uh, they don't give investment advice or anything, that there's no asset management, you can, you know, it's for the do-it-yourselfers, you know? and uh, I know from some of the direct banks uh, on, and uh, online broker firms, they try to get into that service. You know? they, they tried already a few years ago, but again, it's not it's not trivial. You know? It's not trivial. If I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that I mean, I wouldn't expect the banks uh, reducing their own margins. I mean, they wouldn't do it for sure, but I mean. There should have been competitors, right, who are trying to take margin away from someone else. So, was it that we had a monopoly market in the banking industry before? Or? Well, it's like uh, it's like the joke with you know, the economist and the physicist walking along, and the physicist says, "Look, there are a 50 euro bill on the ground," and the economist just walks straight and hey, "Why didn't you stop?" Well, if it was really true, somebody would have picked it up already. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you, know, you need, uh, uh, it, 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 as I said, it's sort of 
either it's developed in-house somehow and you have the resources, or if you're an outsider does it, um, you need a huge amount of resources. You know? And the time has to be right. I mean, think of, uh, I mentioned the dot-com bubble. Uh, that the sort of um, in the late 1990s, you know, the, 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 there was so much euphoria how things could go. You know, the productivity go through the roof. Everybody thought paperless society and this and that. Uh, uh, productivity should really increase, uh, and and you know, stock prices of these companies were skyrocketing. Um, but the speed with which these things happened was uh, vastly. Um, overrated, you know, and, and things became true, you know, we see these stock prices now, the Amazons and, and the like, but it took uh, 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 15 years more than, than, you, than originally one thought. So, you know, we had this huge flop uh, there, and uh, you know, one of our original business angels on Scalable Capital was uh, one of the co-founders of the um, virtually more or less first or second uh, online brokerage uh, firm. Yeah? And, and uh, uh, it, 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 even though they had a hard business, I had a hard time to get this off the ground or so. And especially in, 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 in asset management, it's, um, it's, it's a matter of trust. So it's not, you know, if, if at, at least a few years ago, major banks had, had this good reputation. I wouldn't sort of send money to some institution I don't know. It's different from Zalando or something, you know, buying shoes is a different thing. You know, I know if, they, if I don't like them, I send them back, get my money back. But here, or, or in a credit business, you know, I, if I'm taking an online credit, then you know, they have to trust me to send, uh, just give me money. But there it's just the other way around. So I think uh, uh, you need also sufficient um, disappointment uh, uh, on the investor side and you, the low interest rate helped because you're also unhappy with the conventional uh, offerings you have been using so far, Sparbuch uh, and the like. I think we could open the window again. Yeah. Uh, because they have lunch break now outside, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, Tom. Um, so one question to you. Um, we, we all had this experience that during the last time of the crisis, we had this problem of a, a revelation uh, as well as an information and um, incentive problem to the main sector. So do you think now that achieving the effect of For, sorry for? Oh, there will be. Well, no, I'm, I'm a student of Hyman Minsky. Uh, not, not sure uh, ever anybody knows him, but he uh, was of the, the few post Keynesians uh, teaching in the US. Um, and, and his um, belief was since what um, the, the 1950s, you know, financial markets are inherently unstable. Uh, um, and, and, and in fact, it, they become, uh, so there, there's some new, every time you, know, you have some crisis or some crash, there is new regulation, uh, and, um, but, and, and that may calm down the market, and the, the calmer the markets get, and you saw that in the, uh, the um, uh, S&P 500 example I gave sort of before uh, 2008, uh, it was extremely calm, uh, and so if, if financial and so his hypothesis was also if financial markets are uh, uh, um, you know, the risk is for a longer period below average, uh, uh, market participants become more risky. You know, there are more leveraging going on and, and whatever. And you know, it's, if you just think of leveraging, you just need a small. You know, if you ha highly over leverage, you need a small shock in order to have the system crumble. And given that um, uh, there, there is so much creativity sort of uh, among the market participants, you, you, you know, re re uh, regulation is always catching up only. You know? and, uh, uh, and, and there is regulatory arbitrage uh, because the US is always um, uh, um, essentially uh, part of all the Basel Committee 
uh, uh, regulatory processes that are essentially uh, 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 agreed upon among the major economies or the major central banks on, and regulators, uh, but then they're not participating in it, you know, setting up the rules, but then they themselves never uh, or, or only in parts uh, adopt these rules. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I would not uh, expect that uh, life will be boring at some point. Uh, you know, each time you have new regulation, then um, at least for us it's good because they need another 50 or 100 econometricians out there. Uh, and uh, we, can, we, we produce them. Uh, and I hope you do too here. Uh. So what you were saying is that uh, before uh, people shouldn't bring their uh, money to the savings account because uh, in real terms they will actually make a loss uh, for sure. And uh, what you're saying is they should actually bring it to scale. And uh, I'm just... Uh, no, that's uh, a correct statement, and, yeah. Um, <laughs> well put. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better. So, so if I want to do that, uh, my question would be why, uh, can you say a bit more about why scalable is actually better than the world bank? So if I'm a classical economist, I would say, well, Deutsche Bank has a lot of uh, human resources, well, they can actually uh, be just more uh, specialized in what they are doing because they have more people to do it. So they should actually make it cheaper, right? I mean, because they can specialize better. Um, and the onboarding process online might be expensive for, for an online uh, provider or financial services, for instance. So uh, can you say, is it the transaction cost? Is it the algorithm that is better uh, in, in which form uh, stocks are invested? And on top of that, uh, is, is the investment process uh, individualized for the customer? Or is it a portfolio built for a specific group for investors? Um. <laughs> And I did not pay him for that question, uh, just to <laughs> make sure. <laughs> um, so the, I mean, there's a lot of questions. So, um, you know, and including some contradictions. You know, because he said, well, Deutsche Bank has so many people, they must be, be able to offer it more cheaply. <laughs> uh, so, so they can specialize, of course, and it's true. Um, but um, uh, the, the cost structure, I mean, I never checked. Even so, I'm a shareholder of, of Deutsche Bank uh, as a, for strategic reasons, uh, not because I'm a masochist or something. <laughs> but uh, uh, whenever I feel ill-treated at my bank branch, I can complain and say at the next shareholders meeting, you know, I will, <laughs> I will bring that to the podium. Uh, no, it's... Um, um, I, I think uh, um, they still have a, a, a lot of trust, and, and if you look at the assets they are managing, it's 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 huge. You know, compared, I mean, the, the digital uh, uh, you know, the estimates uh, uh, deviate somewhat, but say it's like three billion in in Germany is is uh, uh, managed, which is peanuts. We have we have two trillion. Uh, zwei billion uh, um, uh, euro just on, on, on our, our savings account. So, so it, it, is, it, it is peanuts there, but um, um, it, 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 it's shrinking there. And uh, uh, I think um, uh, the, the, it's sort of the part of it is the desperation. You know? there is no, what is the alternative to, to Spabo? Uh, the people don't have much imagination. And so some of the idea a little bit about scalable was. We, those we try to we, we try to convince those because we have these extremely low risk categories. You know, value at risk of three percent over one year horizon, um, with a, a, a conscience level of ninety five percent, is is essentially what you have on your savings uh, account after inflation. You know? If you look at the fluctuation of inflation, uh, your real um, um, uh, um, uh, returns you're receiving has a valued risk of three to five percent. So we're offering that. But uh, we are not, you know, the, 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 the idea we had was we, we get these people because they, they want to get away from the um, um, uh, savings account. They know things are overly expensive in, in the traditional banks. And uh, so maybe before I lose money for sure, uh, on a safe savings account, I uh, uh, enter into a little bit of risk and hope I have at least uh, uh, after inflation, I have a, 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 a zero or slightly above zero. And, and then we thought, oh, it's digitization. We get the young you know, internet affine folks you know, finishing their studies three years, four years in the job. 
and, uh, and, and, and now looking ahead, uh, what do I do, uh, how do I save, what about retirement and so on. But that was all wrong. Uh, so the first customers were more my age uh, and um, uh, they were uh, experienced uh, investors. They had tried many things and, and probably didn't feel too happy and then they said, well, uh, I lost money there, I lost money there and there. Maybe I go to scalable, I may be losing money there as well, but at least it's cheaper to lose money there <laughs> uh, than somewhere else. So, um, and it's only gradually when the age uh, came down, it's still uh, uh, in the mid 40s or more 50 than 40. Um, now the investment process, uh, I don't have, I'm not sure what I have in the backup. So uh, it's sort of predictability. So um, uh, what do you want as an investor? Uh, if you can predict returns, you have no risk. Now, if I know where the DAX is at the end of the year and it's reliable in my forecast, I have no risk. You know, it's the deviation from my expectation that is, that is risk, you know, and is in particular the negative deviation. You know. But if I know where, the, where all the 30 DAX stocks end at the end of the year, I pick that one stock, you know, whatever, SAP or whatever it may be, and nothing else. You know. So risk is, essentially comes with the fact that I cannot predict. Here I have 130 years of history of the Dow Jones index, you know, and the question is can I now can I now? This is uh, you know, world, uh, the, uh, the economic crisis, uh, 1930s. This is um, the Black October, uh, Black Monday, October 1987, uh, where the Dow Jones crashed uh, by more than 20 percent in, in one day. I happened to be, in, I happened to be in New York. <laughs> In fact, I just started my uh, my job at, at uh, teaching and. Um, and I had to decide what happened with my retirement benefits. Where, does the, where should the money go? You know? And uh, I hadn't, you had like six or eight weeks time when you, for, uh, after you started to decide how it's allocated, you know, 60% stocks, 40% US treasuries and something like that. I hadn't decided and then this thing crashed. So these are weekly returns. So it's only in the week it was only uh, 17, 18%. I hadn't decided and of course, uh, you know, coming from academia, not in, um, I did not work on finance uh, in my PhD times. Uh, and, um, uh, and so I pa panic was the wrong word. I had no money lost yet, you know, but I said, I said everything, 100% US treasuries. I said, you know, save, save, <laughs> save. <laughs> uh, but you could reverse it. So that's why I started, in fact, getting interested in, 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 uh, in, uh, 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 in financial modeling and, and, and risk uh, modeling. Because you know, if you look up in the textbooks, that's impossible to happen. You know, uh, the, uh, the academic literature didn't say anything. So the question, no, so what do, we, what do um, statisticians do? They, uh, the easiest thing is to see are the returns, uh, the movements to, uh, in this period related to that in the next period. You know? And can I learn from 100, 130 years of uh, Dow Jones history. Can I learn anything about next week, the week after next? And so what we compute is, is correlations you know, with the returns today, next week, week after next, and so on. And the correlations are um, zero. You know, everything between the red lines is, is insignificant. It's simply is, is zero. And, and you know, there's one or two blips are out there, but it's an approximate 95% confidence band. So 5% of these blips should stick out if there's no correlation. And if you look at risk, and risk simply measured as, as absolute returns here. So it's just a, the, the, the range of, of movements. And if you look at the autocorrelation function, a totally different picture. Uh, now, uh, this, if I can predict this, I don't need this. Uh, but uh, if I, um, uh, if I uh, at least I should predict what I can. You know? But in, in the industry, and when you say you know, uh, uh, established banks have you know, uh, specialists on all sorts of things, but when they do research in asset management, I, it feels like 90% of the resources go into predicting here. You know? and, and you're paying for that, people trying to predict white noise. Uh, and um, so here, at least, there is some potential there. You know, it's, you're far away from perfect, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, you know, but it's better than a coin flip. And, 
And so um, this is sort of the algorithm, essentially, I'm not sure what comes here. So what the algorithm essentially does is um, for each, um, and that was one of your question, how individualized are these things? So there are 23 risk classes. So there are first uh, 23 buckets in that sense. So you're modeling 23 buckets, but within the buckets, uh, you model customers differently because they have different tax situation. They, they have this, um, I don't know what the Freistellungsauftrag word is, uh, but they have this tax allowance of 801 euro or so. Whether you have that or not, that makes a difference. Whether you have a savings plan and so on, it makes a difference. Um, uh, so that is individually done, but uh, the generally the, the risk classes we, we model separately. And so every day we're running these 10,000 simulations of likely path that a euro or risk class 17 could take over the next year. And then we are sort of reading out the valued risk. You essentially uh, look at 95% of the path end up above, 5% end below, and this is our valued risk projection. And in this case, the line ended at 50 minus 15.1. And if you had told us 12% is my limit, then this is too high uh, for uh, you know, it's one, what, one quarter too high. And if, say, the risk increase, you know, last week you were here, this week you are here, then maybe if the risk comes because the stock market uh, was, was wild, then one rebalances in order to get that in line again. You know? And if it's the other way around, if it's too risk, uh, uh, if it doesn't have sufficient risk, if you're below your risk target, then the, the risk is increased because the, uh, the saying is, you know, if you, if you are an investor, you need two things to put on the table. You need um, money and you need, um, uh, you, have to, you have to also uh, put uh, your risk bearing capacity or your nerves on the table. And that one wants to use, you know, because in the long term, high, higher risk produces uh, higher returns, but not in the short term. If you look, remember the DAX VDAX picture. In the short term, somehow it's different. Uh, it's just the opposite. In the long run, it is uh, high risk, high return. In the short run, it seems to be, or high risk in the short run means above average risk for an asset means typically bad news. Uh, and below risk means, uh, average risk means it's good news. There are exceptions, all these safe haven assets like German treasury bills or gold or so, uh, they, they handle somewhat different. And that's what it looks like. Um, this is sort of, uh, not wall painting or anything. This is uh, uh, sort of a back test. You know, and and the, the difference between conventional, you know, if, if my wife is still for, for reasons of, uh, I don't know, uh, partially customer of her uh, bank, which is a bank with many, many branches uh, in, in Germany. And when she, so she's classified as a moderate investor. You know, if, you, if you go to a traditional bank, you're classified as conservative, moderate, or uh, I don't know, chance oriented or whatever, or dynamic risk person. Uh, everything sounds great. You know, I always think, well, I'm conservative. That's true. I'm also moderate and probably I'm also, you know, uh, uh, um, I'm, somewhat dynamically uh, uh, inclined also. Uh, and what they do then, they say, okay, you know, Mrs. Smith, you get 50% stocks, 50% bonds, and then her job uh, is, is uh, you know, the advisor's job is to keep that 50-50 over time constant. Uh, and for that, you pay 2% just to, a year just to get the 50-50. So here, <clears throat> it's different. You want to keep the risk constant. In order to keep the risk constant, you need to shift the weights. And then you see here, these are you know, stocks, um, uh, commodities, real estate, and so on. The brighter the color, the, the typically risk, less risky. If you look at the stocks, the darkest now, dot-com crisis started 2000. You had a uh, at stock uh, what, about 40% and it dropped uh, up to close to five or something. There was a brief recovery, but the dot-com crisis was over spring 2003, and so the, the, uh, it went up again, up to what, 70, 80 percent, then came Bear Stearns, uh, and then you see how the, the risk sort of, uh, the, the, the stock, uh, um, share of stocks in the portfolio dropped, and when Lehman came, it was down to what, 10 or something, 15. Uh, so it's sort of, uh, and this is, that's the service essentially, keeping your risk fixed, you know. Um, 
that's, that's what behind it, and that's where we are, yeah. Otherwise, I recommend go on, uh, come to one of our, we have, uh, we have this um, um, roadshow, even in Bremen, we, uh, I think uh, we, we are occasionally, and uh, uh, they know more than I do about the interna there. But I mean, I mean, uh, this is the thing, you know, I mean, if, if the, this is where the motivation for this whole business also came. You know, the, 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 the co-founders from, from, you used to be at Goldman, they had all these friends uh, uh, and relatives asking, I, I have these 30,000 or, you know, I inherited 50,000, what should I do with the money? You know, and you know, with 50,000 you, you can't show up at Goldman Sachs and say, I want to invest there. And the, the, the least thing you want to tell them is, you know, go to your bank and ask them. You know, because then you know you get your in-house uh, mutual fund uh, and uh, probably one of the more pricier products or so. And so it, it's uh, the democratization of uh, asset management is what some of these robo-advisors uh, try to uh, argue what they're doing. But it, it, I mean, it, the, there we are in the discussion of uh, what is self-learning, you know. So if I run every day a regression and update my coefficients uh, and, and I run it automatically, is this self-learning or, or not? Uh, um, I, <coughs> I, um, before I uh, um, started uh, teaching in New York at my... Um, PhD time, I, I, I wrote a paper on artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah, we're talking back 1987 or something, which uh, I think the term artificial intelligence came up in, in the mid 50s or so, I'm not so sure. Um, but a totally different situation. It was a project for the US Air Force supporting pilots in combat situations of how that they would do sort of the right strategy and, 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 and they don't have, you don't have much time to decide you know, in these things, you have to be fast. Um, and, and so we had this basic discussion, you know, uh, 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 you know the, 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 the military side, Air Force side always wanted to have these fancy words you know, that what we are doing is sort of high tech modern and so on. And for us it was just, you know, it's just uh, statistics. You know? And I, I used to, um, um, I don't know, Renaissance Technology, is, maybe, is it known? You know, it's one of the most successful hedge funds out there. Uh, I said you cannot predict, uh, there are other uh, things. Uh, uh, this was just linear prediction when you talk about autocorrelation function. Now, there are also nonlinear things out there and uh, there's more information. But Renaissance Technology, was founded by uh, um, Jim Simons, who used to be professor at my university in, in New York, and a mathematician. And he, he, he said at some point, well, and he used to, in younger years, he worked for the CIA. He was this code breaker person. Uh, but then he criticized uh, the US for the Vietnam War. Then he got kicked out and uh, became professor of mathematics and a very successful one. <laughs> and then he founded that company, and I was sort of on this. Uh, I was sort of advising uh, a bit the company, uh, or one of the subsidiaries and uh, of the company, on on modeling and econometric things. Um, he's out of business now, but he he had sort of he did these things what we call now big data. They had a huge data collection. Uh, they started in the late 80s, and and worked with uh, fancy methods. You know, one, once the Soviet Union broke up, they hired all these high physicists and probabilists coming out of the Kolmogorov school and these kind of things. And uh, so he's out of business now, he's just um, out of daily operative business, but he gives interviews and he, um, recently I saw an interview where he was asked a question, oh, uh, Professor Simons, you, you've been, you know, in the late 80s you have been um, already working with big data and artificial intelligence. How came you up with that idea in that early period? And sort of he thinks and looks to the ceiling and thinks and thinks and then he said, well, you know, it's all statistics. Um, so it's, um, um, uh, uh, it's, it's not, it's dying here. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, these are conventional models. So in, you know, say we do these risk projections, you know, these models, they're updated every day. 
um, uh, and, and they sort of do some self-learning. Because what, what happens is crucial, you know, if, if you don't want to just because the market, the risk shoots up, you know, which is sort of a sell sign typically. But you know, then of course things have happened already. You, know, you don't want to, after the fact, selling is typically a bad strategy. So you want to predict, uh, is that shock, does it have impact, uh, sort of long lasting impact? Will the volatility stay high? or will it uh, recede quickly? You know? And typically, if you have sort of exogenous shocks like Fukushima or so, or 9-11, uh, some terrible thing happened, affects the, the, the financial markets immediately, but it's not a financial market inherent problem. It's sort of an exogenous problem. Lehman.com was an inherent, you know, sort of a, a Minsky kind of problem. Um, and, and, uh, and markets sort of, you, you see that, you're not, you, know, you have to look at not only one shock, but you have to see how does it, what happens afterward. Is it declining or not? So in order to make that um, decision, um, you, know, you, you essentially do this, you know, the, the, the predict kind of this amplitude of these thousands of uh, simulations, essentially telling you, is it receding after, you know, during the course of one year, then the amplitude at the end stays narrow. But if you have sort of more long memory type features then uh, sneaking in, then it keeps, stays white and then you want to um, uh, 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 rebalance. You know. So uh, yeah, I'm sort of from a traditional uh, econometrics background uh, and, and if I look at the uh, software packages on, on AI or so, I say 80% is conventional and then there are a few and then you have uh, uh, neural networks is, I think we have met many, many years ago uh, at I don't know which meeting where in the 90s or somewhere where this was a hot topic, then it disappeared totally. Uh, and it, now it's back again because uh, statisticians got into it and not just computer scientists. Uh, and uh, so, or, or you know, other disciplines uh, contributed uh, also to the, to the field. Um, and you know, of course now we have all the machine learning and, uh, and there are interesting techniques out there, you know, the, the random forest and boosting strategies. Um, so there is, I hope they learn everything here. <laughs> or there. Yeah. I, I totally agree that there's, there's nothing intelligent in these um, yeah, methods. It, it, um, when you talk to our colleagues from the informatics department, they just use statistical methods. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's really pure statistics uh, behind the uh, um, robots. Yeah, yeah it's, I mean, it, I mean, in Munich we started a program um, uh, two years ago in, in, in data science in the stats department. It's 50% uh, computer science, 50% stats. Um, uh, I think it's good that the two come together. You know, uh, and. and uh, the statisticians were eager to sort of take the first step because once the, the, the computer scientists take over, uh, 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 then it takes sort of a, a different turn, these things. Um, but it, it's of course in big data, it, it's organization of data, uh, sort of how you organize things. This is, is, is crucial uh, and cleaning data sets and so on, you know, th this is crucial, but uh, that's not all. You know, then, then the real work starts. You know, it's, it's, uh, um, and um, um, we, we'll see how, how this evolves, um, but uh, it, it, this is sort of mostly is plain vanilla stuff. And even if you look at you know, um, you know, boosting methods or so, it's essentially like kind of recursive regressions here running, uh, or neural networks, there are nonlinear regressions here running. Um, you, you know, so it, it, it's, but one thing is it's a different language they're speaking. This is you know, uh, another thing that makes life a bit difficult. So we, 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 you know, we try to stay away from catchphrases, but uh, once in a while you need those too, especially when you're on a job interview. You, know, you have to drop the right catchphrases. So. Well, well, I've once I become a digi economist, then I'll be uh, more often here. <laughs> well, thanks for your patience. Thank you. <laughs>